Convention Center in Nairobi, where we are having discussions about the SME sector, which is a very significant one when it comes to the economy and the, what it, the role it plays is unmatched. And we're going to be having discussions on different facets of the same to try and understand what has been uh, considered an issue, what is still an issue, and what we can look forward to going forward. Some of the things have already been mentioned by the speakers who spoke uh, before we went on the break. We had the chief guest, was the CS for Interior and Coordination of National Government, that's Fred Matiangi, as well as the Nation Media Group Chairman, that's Wilfred Kiboro, uh, and Fred Ngatia, uh, sorry, uh, Richard Ngatia, I beg your pardon, who is the president of KNCCI, who are also the co the partners in this uh, expo alongside Nation Media Group. And so now on stage I have a panel of six. Uh, we, are, we have already hit the constitutional requirement of gender balance. That is a good thing. This is a very good start for the expo, I must say. Um, I'll just introduce them real quick. Right to my far right, I have, we have Richard Ngati, who's the president of the Kenyan National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, next to him, we have Flora Mutahi, who's the founder and CEO of Melvin Marsh International, and she's also the immediate former chairperson of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Uh, next to her, we have Bwana Richard Muteti, who's the chief executive officer of the Kenyan National Federation of Juakali Associations. And then next to him, <coughs> we have Beatrice Mwasi, the secretary general of the Leather Apex Association of Kenya. Then we have Bwana Kaxton Masudi, Deputy Commissioner, Policy and Tax Advisory at the Kenya Revenue Authority. And immediate, to my immediate right, we have Bwana Charles Hinga, who is the Principal Secretary of, Hub, of Housing and Urban Development. Thank you for joining us. And you've been here earlier on, and we've listened to some of the, the stage has been set based on what had already been spoken about when it comes to um, the state of the economy being in a challenging position for uh, just as a point to bring out. And it has been a concern about um, how are we dealing with corruption, for instance? How are we, how we playing our role in, in this, in terms of the private sector? It takes two to tango, you know? And so the private sector has been accused of also playing its part. I'll begin with, they say ladies first, I'll begin with you, uh, Flora. Um, but as a person who's been in the private sector for, for a while, and you've also, you know, led the Association of Manufacturers, what, what needs to be done on the end of you know, the private sector to ensure that this dance of corruption also ends on this other side, based on what the CS said? Wow, you're right. Um, for corruption, it does take um, two to tango. But I also believe when you have a very difficult environment to work, that is when people's ethics and integrity actually start become compromised. So you've, you've put up a big industry, you need to get a sale done, and um, you're told you have to do X, Y, and Z. So I think streamlining, um, streamlining, making things very, very transparent, allowing people, you know, you know the way in the, in the procurement, how it's sort of now, we're trying to streamline things and actually make it very simple for people to actually see what is being done is one of the things that is going to help. Private sector really, a lot of the very serious business people actually have cowed away from um, supplying, let's say, government, which is the largest buyer, again, because of those corruption issues. And what tends to happen then, you tend to find the middlemen, which only raises the cost of, 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 of procurement. So that is, that, that, that is also another negative part of corruption. And um, what, do we, what, what, what can private sector, uh, private sector do is to continue to speak about it, continue to have conversations, try and push to, to, you know, to, to build transparency. I do, I do know, for example, the, the bribery bill was actually supported by private sector um, and, you know, of course, brought to light quickly. And things like that to actually start making it um, easier for businesses to be more transparent. Okay, I'd like the same to just go to Wanangacha on the same. What needs to be done? Because we are seeing that there's a lot of action when it comes to what we are calling Kamata Kamata Friday, for instance. And we see a lot of government officials. In some cases, we see business persons. But the feeling is that we are still not gotten to the point where the private sector is being held fully to account in regards to corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think my immediate thought would be, first of all, it, is, it would be very, very important to have dialogue between the private sector, social sector, and the public sector, so that you, uh, you remove the gap between the private sector and the government. What has been happening is that information does not disseminate to the private sector whenever uh, you know, the government comes up 
with uh, punitive measures to make sure there's no corruption, that information does not go to the government, I mean to the private sector. Uh, secondly, it is very important, the issue of payments to suppliers. If you, know, if you, you, you normally, as a government, they do business uh, with, they take money and do business uh, with the, the private sector's uh, resources. And what happens is, if they keep their money for a period of more than 60 days, definitely what happens is, uh, like the first speaker sp uh, said, is to add, uh, people will start adding costs of, 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 of products that uh, they're selling to any, whether it's a government or, or whether it's the uh, private sector. Uh, thirdly, it is uh, again uh, important to make sure that uh, uh, the private sector also understands issues of governance. Uh, corporate governance understands issues of uh, ethics, understands issues of, uh, 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 you know, how to put up uh, their structures. Uh, that, that is very important. It is also, again, something that you need to look at in terms of making sure that uh, cost of doing business is low. Because, uh, like this morning, uh, we had the CSA saying, you have multiple licenses, somebody coming from Transoia all the way to Mombasa, you'll find a county wanting to charge, uh, you know, uh, fees over and over, uh, 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 you know, on top of the other. So it is important to reduce as such to make sure that uh, then uh, the, the, the cost is lowered. Because what happens then, you'll find people wanting to add more to their invoices so that it covers for the lost time that or, 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 the, or the amounts that are, you know, normally are put on top of, of, of any uh, products that are being sold across. Okay. I think uh, Beatrice would like to just add to that. I'd like to, to jump in there. Um, first, I agree with, the, with what uh, Bonangati and, and, and Flora have said. But I also want to, to, to think that even if it takes two to tango, we should have somebody who's outside the two who can apprehend these two that are tangling. So let us not dismiss it and say, because it takes two, it takes the private sector and public uh, or civil servant to tango, and therefore they collude into um, uh, you know, engaging in corruption. Let us have a system that can apprehend those two that are tangling. Now, some time back a study was done, and youth were asked whether they will resist undertaking uh, you know, any um, corruption activity in order to access services, and they said, no, I think 62% said they will willingly and happily engage in corruption. Why did they say that? Because that's the only model, business model, that they know. What is happening to those that have uh, been apprehended in the past? Have we had uh, people arrested? Have we had uh, monies recovered? You see, if what society sees is that you can engage into um, corruption activities, and you manage to you know, maneuver your way through it, then society gets accustomed to it. I want to believe that I'm, I'm inviting a third person who should be on the lookout for the two. So it doesn't matter whether the person who is initiating corruption activities in the private sector or public, to me it doesn't matter. I feel like we should have a system that works in such a way that when somebody is found engaging in corruption, they're apprehended, it's punished, and then slowly society will grow to understand that we have no room for such corruption activities in the country. Okay, and one of the things that like the taxman has been doing, you've been seeing a number of people who've been arrested and have been charged because of tax evasion and the likes. And um, like what has partly been alluded to is that when the economy is tough, you find people try to become now crafty in regards to where can I save, where can I avoid to give, putting aside ma matters of morality. Now, one of the things that the manufacturers have been feeling is that there's a conversation about pending bills, but there's not, nothing much about VAT refunds. And there's 100 billion shillings or thereabouts that is owed you know, to businesses in terms of VAT refunds. Where are we with that? Just to, just to take forward the conversation. Caxton. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, I would like to start right where we left it. Um, the question about uh, corruption. Corruption doesn't occur because people have problems. Corruption actually occurs because people don't have a strong moral value system. And uh, if you realize, most of us probably came from backgrounds that uh, were much more difficult, but you still had very strong integrity, even at that time. People who engage in corruption are not people who are needy 
all the time. Actually, some of the people engaging in corruption are people who have a lot of resources to the extent that they don't even need to engage in that corruption. So because of lack of ethos, we got into this problem. So I think the question is, how do we deal with it? There are basically two parts to it. The first one is, how do we prevent it? The second one is then, how do we deal with those who engage in it? And I think uh, the CS and everybody here has talked about how to deal with people who engage in corruption. But I think I would just like to make some few comments on uh, how do we prevent uh, corruption. One is we need to address uh, our own values as a country so that we shift away from engaging in this vice. And uh, number two is for governments, we are trying to create transparent systems and trying to keep um, all processes as transparent as possible. And this is where automation is coming in, uh, ensuring that it is easy for people to transact with the government, it is easier to communicate with the government, and also to promote free flow of information so that government is able to detect you know, where corruption is taking place in good time so that uh, preventive measures can be taken. In uh, relation to the question that you just asked about uh, refunds, I know this has been quite difficult for, for some time, but I want to tell you that progress is being made. And uh, for this financial year alone, we have paid out 20 billion and we are having a pending 1.2 billion. The problem has been that the allocations for refunds has been slightly lower than uh, the available refunds, and this is being addressed by the Ministry of uh, National Treasury, and we expect that uh, going forward, this will also be addressed. But just to make you appreciate how we seriously deal with this issue, is that we have reduced the processing time for refund claims from 90 days to 48 days. The only reason why you don't probably get money after 48 days is when we do not have funds yet available for disbursement. Thank you. All right, and just as a point of, you've said, you know, going forward we are seeing, we are likely to see this money is coming. Do we have a time frame? that you know, someone can actually say, I expect that within the next X number of days, the, you know, the rectification, if we may call it that way, is going to be in place? Um, discussions are ongoing. Uh, we may not put a direct uh, time frame, but those discussions are actually discussing the issue of when the money will be available as well. So I think after the discussions, we should be able to, to communicate by when the backlogs for refunds will be cleared. All right. Um, I'd like to bring in P.S. Hinga. Um, you know, uh, under the Big Four agenda, one of the pillars is housing, which sits right in your office. And wh one of the things that um, has been raised as a concern is that you'll find that the projects that the government wants to do to tend, you know, bring the affordable housing dream to reality is that you'll have those investors with deep pockets being able to snap up most of the business. And so you find the smaller investors may not have as much an opportunity um, to maximize on that resource. So how are we working around this to ensure that the SMEs also get you know, a fair opportunity to make that money? Thank you very much. And just before I answer that question, allow me uh, to also voice my, um, give my opinion on the issue of the corruption. Yes. Um, because I'm, a, I'm a, an accounting officer, so I'm right in the mix uh, of these issues. Uh, there are a couple of points to, uh, to make here, is that the day we focus on making systems to work, then focusing a lot of energy on the vice itself, create environments of certainty, and then, as my brother has said here, work on our value systems, because what, what has happened is that we, the people, have sort of uh, have sort of found uh, a way of working around mediocrity. So we know that there's a lot of mediocrity going on, and we've sort of embraced mediocrity as being okay by what. Um, yeah. 
by making the systems, uh, you know, by first of all being uncomfortable around issues of uh, mediocrity. Now, um, I was in Abu Dhabi about a week ago and I visited the Abu Dhabi municipality and they have taken themselves so seriously about this issue of service delivery that, for example, when it comes to things like processing uh, building approvals, they set themselves up a target of moving from 100 days to 10 days. Within the time that they set for themselves, now they're down to five days it takes for you to process those things. And we can do the same thing by focusing on making systems to work. The day we simplify procurement, procurement now you're almost like you need a PhD, uh, you know, to, to be able to understand it is complex, and yet the Constitution, Article 227, uh, is very clear on what constitutes fair procurement. So. Those are some of the things that we need to do because the other day I went to a school and I asked the young students there, what do you want to be in life? And I, I was expecting doctors and engineers, all those things that we wanted to be, and they said they want to become procurement officers. That is where the problem lies. Now, to your question to me, um, we, yes, this is a capital intensive program but also the affordable housing program. It's capital intensive, but it's also labor intensive. Now what we did is that we looked at the program holistically, and we said, yes, my first mandate is, to, is that word affordability. And so it's easy for me to go to China and all these other places where they can write big checks, and we bring in enough Chinese and they, they get this program done at a fraction of the cost. But we said we will have missed an opportunity uh, to leverage the large economies of scale to start denting some of the numbers that you're talking about. So we stripped a house into components. And we said, out of these components that make a house, how many of these shall we insist shall be procured and shall be made in Kenya? And we looked at 69 items. And we said, these 69 items can be done locally, all right? And not only locally, we said we want them to be done by SMEs. 69 of how many? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot more, uh, but we identified 69, okay? Now, these 69, we realized that we don't have standards. For example, there's no standard door in Kenya. There's no standard window in Kenya, all right? And so, therefore, there's no SME today that can go make doors knowing that that door, there is a market. Because what is the size of a door? It's normally the space you leave after you've, co you've completed building the house. So we've now set a standard, and we have done the designs for those doors, and we have given those to the Juakali associations. And the, the standards are uploaded on the National Construction website. Now, what has happened is that we engaged, and we had a very deliberate conversation about how do we move from talking to action. So we took three Juakali associations, who I'm very proud that they're here. Uh, I don't know whether they left uh, Ngokankam, which is Ngong Road, Kamukunji, and Kariobangi. We know our people know how to make doors. The only challenge is that there are many brokers in between. So we said that for Park Road, which is our first flagship project, we needed 10,000 doors. And we said, how do we make them to do those doors? After a long conversation with the, uh, the investor who is building the houses, we finally settled, and let me tell you, the groups uh, that we're talking about collapsed their three associations. They formalized themselves without government, so this thing is not about more government regulating. They collapsed their three associations into a company that today employs 10,000 people. And they have managed, yeah, you can clap because I am very proud of them. Then they have managed not only to meet that order, but they have also given us the confidence to extrapolate that program because in, I'm, about, I'm about to award about 15,000 units and those 15,000 units we've said the doors and the windows shall be done by Juakali. Now that is 100,000 doors. Now if 10,000 doors was 122 million shillings that went directly to the Juakalis without going to brokers, you do the maths, how much is it going to be for the 100,000 doors? And you know in a house, there are more windows than doors. So again, you do the maths, and we're now talking about six, five, six billion that is going to go directly to our SMEs. I believe that the way to grow our economy is not PhDs in all the, it's common sense approach, 
but also we have got to be patriotic hard because these uh, people who are in the informal, as long as we allow them to continue being in the informal, what happens is that we have a, an economy that is, shield, that is uh, sort of supported by a very few people who are in the informal economy. And therefore, we need to bake a bigger cake, make sure that we bring in the SMEs into the mainstream economy by doing practical, yeah, practical uh, approach, uh, common sense approach. And I do believe that Ngokankam now is no longer called informal. They're no longer informal traders. And I believe Mr. Caxton here is going to be happy because sooner than later he's going to, he knows that he has got 10,000 new taxpayers. Thank you. All right. Bona Muteti, I would like to bring you in at this point because he's spoken about the Juakali, which is who you represent. And one, are we seeing more Juakali, uh, you know, uh, business persons doing what he's talking about, forming companies as a way to try and develop themselves and just to amass the ability to deliver? Are we seeing more of this or is it, are these unique cases? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, I first want to take this opportunity to thank uh, P.S. Hinga for being very practical in how he approached us and how he's working with uh, some of our associations in Nairobi. Government is the biggest purchaser. And we have been saying this all along. Uh, it's a very long time since the government bought anything from the Juakali sector. Uh, some time back, we were in furniture. The government had stopped, had given a moratorium for importation of furniture so that that opportunity could have been given to the sector. That was not measurable and it disappeared somewhere along the way. So I just want to thank him because my members are here who are participating in that. I want to confirm that this project is benefiting the Jokali sector and we are just about to roll it across, uh, across the country. Uh, for your question, you know, um, what the Jokali sector knows how to do is to create jobs. So if you ask me if it, we are seeing more jobs being created, if you go to the statistics, the only, the only sector that can accept you without education, you having been retrenched, you having dropped out of school, and you having not known what you want to do is a sector. So if you look at the st statistics and the majority of the MSC sector in the, in the Yokali sector, yes, we are creating. We are seeing a lot of uh, movement. Our places are bulging. And I want to agree with the Chairman Kiboro when he said that if you are working in policy, we put good policies that can help you in future. Most of the people who come to my office, they want me to create space for them. If you look at Maasai Market, it's now bulging. And it's now, uh, it started with a few hundred people, now it's thousands. If you look at uh, Kamukunji, and Kamukunji Jokali Association is represented here, it started with 300 people. Now it is around 10,000. We are creating jobs. What we want is just three things, so that we even create more. And uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, Chairman Kiboro reminded you that when you occupy those offices, do something, even targeting yourself in future. I've seen few, uh, earlier people who are working in policies who come to my office to complain about the policies that are there. And they had the opportunity uh, to change them when they were there. So, um, are we making jobs? Are we creating jobs? I have here several chairmen. When I was told to invite 200 people, I didn't know how to do it. We are making a lot of jobs, but our work sites are disappearing. If you talk about corruption, one of the biggest uh, victims of corruption of our land that is disappearing through corruption is the land of the Jokali sector. If you look at uh, where our people are operating, are operating on the trenches, on the cemeteries because most of their land were grabbed. So what we are just asking is that give us land and I'm happy you talked about physical planning. In the physical planning space, the sector is never factored. Uh, physical planning, you plan everything, you forget about the working operation sites for the Juakali sector. And what do they do? They also want space. They want to operate near the market. So they start operating in front of your doors, in front of your houses, in front of your trenches. And we are saying, when are we going to change this? So if we get work sites and workspaces, we are going to, to create even more jobs. So we are creating jobs. All right. So I just want to clarify. You sound like business is doing very well for Joakali. And we've been hearing people saying that business is not doing well. So maybe we could just clarify for us, is Joakali the place to be now? Because it seems that's where the money is. 
Okay, there is creating jobs and there is doing well. <laughs> and I want, uh, somebody was telling me that we need to change the, ju the word juakali and we, that's a very debatable uh, term because as I told our patron here and whom I am thanking very much for the support, uh, for us, we have come to realize that uh, jua means knowledge, kali means sharp. So jua kali is sharp knowledge. <laughs> These are the only people who can make your cars, make your windows without having have gone to school. So are we creating jobs? Yes, we are creating jobs. Are we doing very well in, uh, in terms of money? That is debatable because there are they're, 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 they're several, uh, my people are here. We are struggling with it, but we are trying. Okay, so I, I see Beatrice wants to uh, point out, then we'll come this way, because I think that one, everyone wants to respond to so, that as well. So as well. He, he happily confirms that uh, they're creating jobs, but the big question here is, are people in Joakali engaged in gainful entrepreneurship? Are they gaining out of their, their efforts? And I think going by the numbers in terms of uh, income uh, generated in the Joakali sector vis-a-vis -vis the numbers that we have, I doubt that we are really um, very vibrant as a, as, as a sector. And I feel like that is something that we need to start tackling. But that said, I want to plug in to what uh, PSA Hinga said in, the, in, in, in line with, the, with, the, with the, the housing scheme that, that, that is coming up. And pointed a couple of things and what uh, caught my attention was the fact that uh, production of the products here is not uh, competitive in, in comparison to other, you know, our suppliers, especially from um, external sources like, uh, like like China. So the issue of competitive, I want us to underscore the, the, the aspect of competitiveness. And then the second thing is you actually confirmed that many years later, after us preaching the gospel of industrialization, is that we've never standardized. So basically, we are at the advent of industrialization today. We are beginning to now create a standards upon which now we can spur industrialization, which is a, a key thing I want us to un underscore that. The third thing I want us to underscore is sustainability. And why am I bringing sustainability in? It's because today, the Joakali, that have gotten the opportunity to supply to the housing scheme are busy. But what happens after? Because you see already what you're saying, um, government is willing to pay the extra shilling so that the SME uh, gets an opportunity to supply. But what happens when the, the, the project is over and you have this many people that you brought into the Jokali sector on the, on the, on the basis of, of supplying? Going back to number one, Actually, before I go to number one, I want also to appreciate your model because the model in the sense that you are working with associations and by virtue of the fact that you are working with the association, you are directly feeding into the Juakali sector. If it was an open bid, let's say we are promoting by Kenya, build Kenya as it were, and this is uh, the case in the leather industry, then chances are that you'll find still the big giants coming in and pushing off the Juakali. But your model of working with associations and these associations of you know, micro, small entrepreneurs, then you have facilitated access to Juakali, and that is to me a very big plus. I want to just okay. speak about competitiveness. Very briefly, kindly. Yeah, briefly. So, and I wanted to draw these in light of uh, the, the, the leather industry. And what I'm trying to say is that if we can't compete, we will not even be able to survive locally alone within the region, forget about going uh, global, uh, Banangati are talking about us accessing a global market. And that is something that we need to address with utmost urgency in the sense that how do we ensure that we can even fulfill demand locally? In the leather sector today where we stand, we are importing more than we are producing locally. So meaning there is demand here and some of the products that are coming from international markets are not cheaper than what we are producing here. Go to Biashara Street, you'll be able to get a leather shoe that is going for 24,000 Kenya shillings. And people are happily able to, 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 to buy that. So what is this thing that is making a product external more competitive? We need to innovate. People will say products that are coming in are more tuned to their needs. So those of us who are in the micro, small, and medium enterprises, we need to start understanding that we can no longer sell what we can make by virtue of the fact that you have some machine, you have some model that can fashion us to a specific kind of products. Mm. We must start thinking about how can we be market responsive? How can we identify needs out there and engineer solutions in form of products so that we can adequately cater for those needs? 
that is not uh, happening uh, currently and it's something that we have to do. The second thing that we have to do, we must seriously start addressing the issue of cost of production. A couple of people have spoken about it during the introductory remarks, but it is enough to, you know, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's now time for us to start addressing it. In the, on the side of footwear, I will tell you, we are 30% more expensive to produce footwear here in comparison to, to Ethiopia. Why? We do not have an industrial support base. Most of the accessories are brought in. And when they are brought in, they are levied uh, uh, duties. And that is why, as an industry, we are pushing so that we can have zero rating of production inputs. That way, because we don't have the industries here, we cannot make buckles, we do not have soles to make, to make the shoes, we have to import them. So if you're going to levy duty on the production inputs, so from the onset, I fail to become competitive. Another thing I think a couple of people spoke about is the cost of labor and the cost of production sites. We do not have production sites. If somebody, as I say, is working by the graveyard, working on the ground, the chances of them being productive is going to be really, you know, they will be less productive than somebody who's working from a conducive environment. Okay. Taking, taking just, uh, let me give a statistic on the leather industry. Right now in Kenya, the best we can do is about one person can produce three to five pairs of shoes. For us to break even, according to the regional statistics, we must produce between 12 per person, 12 to 15 pairs. So you can imagine, we are operating, guys are busy, but we are not breaking even. We must address the competitiveness issue so that then we can be able to add, um, cater for the demand locally and start venturing into the region and globally. All right, thank you. And I think um, uh, the PS wanted to respond to that, then we'll come to that side to respond to the same. Yeah, Just a minute. I think just a couple of points. Uh, one, um, we must not let the perfect be the enemy of good. And I can tell you something that, again, going back to the Gonkankam uh, situation, the Chinese contractor uh, had the prices they had given us for those doors was it's insane. And we said, we had to put our foot down and say, even if you gave us those doors for free, we will not take them. Why? Because there's another bigger agenda. And so I believe that what we've started with Gokankam, yes, the price may not be as competitive, but we now have addressed the first thing, which is we have created opportunity. And over time, we expect these prices are going to come down. So let's get started. I think the most important thing is to get started. It wasn't perfect, and they can tell you it wasn't perfect, but we have learned from uh, some of the challenges they had and now, as we go to roll out the bigger program, I think we'll use some of those lessons. The other thing that I will say is uh, uh, the issue of sustainability. Now, we must have dreams as a country. Now, if we as a country are known to make the best doors in the region, this issue, I sit on the board of Shelter Africa. In the continent, we have got 52 million housing shortage. Those are opportunities. So, Let's not just think about producing doors for our consumption here, but let's elevate our faith and think about who is going to go build those houses in Rwanda, in, in DRC, and so on and so forth. That's how I believe we're going to become more competitive. And lastly, it's very, very important to understand that these, there are a lot of unintended consequences. Things that we never planned but happened anyway because we made a decision. So for example, the Ngokankam, team, uh, we, the order book was 122 million shillings for the doors only. After doing the doors, they've come back, and because they've joined the mainstream economy now, they were able to go to a financial institution, and they said, hang on a second, here is 33 million shillings of the money we've made. We want you to help us to buy the same houses we built the doors. I mean, this is it's a beautiful story. Again, that was not what we had in mind, but ask yourselves, if 80% of all our workforce is informal, and we're building these houses, who is going to occupy those houses? It is the biggest challenge is in the informal sector. So what we've seen is that their income has gone up, all right? They've joined the mainstream economy, and today I will be very proud to uh, be able to hand over keys to them as the new homeowners of this country. And I think that is how we are going to together build this economy. So if we can take what we've done with Mukankam and extrapolate it with other sectors and move away from talk shows to getting things done.
All right. Thank I just want to go yeah. to uh, Ngachi and Flora uh, on that. Let's begin with the lady kindly. She had raised her hand earlier. Then we can come to Bona Ngachi kindly. Thank you. I, okay. take that. I want to commend the uh, peers okay. and, of course, uh, the ministry uh, for you know, taking up the project on uh, affordable housing and, of course, supporting our members who are the Jokali, uh, the Kenya Federation of Jokali, and, of course, the SMEs. And uh, you've clearly stated that those are opportunities that are available for the entire SMEs to come and you know, uh, make sure that they're also uh, filling that gap and doing their business. But there's one uh, uh, problem that we see as the chamber. Where is the finance? The moment you give these people their, their, their business, you give them their orders, the next challenge that they're facing is finance. Now, we as the Kenya National Chamber, uh, what you're doing is to partner with organizations. For example, we have partnered with the KBA. And this is to make sure that, one, there's financial inclusion. Uh, two, we are able to partner with other banks across uh, the country. And, and therefore, what we have done is to partner, for example, with Equity Foundation, where we are preparing SMEs on uh, 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 financial literacy. Uh, we are preparing them in terms of bookkeeping. We are preparing them in terms uh, and capacity building them. And therefore, so that, that way, by the time you give them the business, then they are able and ready to face that challenge, to face the business, because they can be able to get uh, finance uh, from banks. Secondly, we have also partnered with, uh, uh, through the Swedish uh, government, uh, through FSD, we have been able to partner with them so that we support SMEs through uh, a system uh, called uh, Retail Pay, where you can be able, once you're in that system, you can be able to be allocated uh, you know, uh, some guarantee so that you collect your goods from uh, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, your customer where you're buying your goods. Uh, they will be paid directly through that system. You'll be able to pay and they'll give you about 30 to 45 days to repay. Now, having said that and looking at the opportunities available in the big four, we have gone across to partner uh, with the uh, Sharjah uh, UAE government and Sharjah what they are doing we have come and we have sat and we are looking at those opportunities and we are saying uh, there are opportunities you are giving in terms of doors. Probably there are 16 components an SME must uh, deliver. But there are certain components where they cannot meet uh, the standards that you have given. And therefore what we do, you will find them wanting to go and buy those products in either China or in Dubai. So in Sharjah, what we have done is we have been allocated an office where we shall support you in terms of uh, logistics, we shall support you in terms of visas, and over and above that, through a partnership with Etihad Insurance, they will guarantee you to collect uh, goods uh, and they'll give you a payment lead time of uh, 150 days. That allows you to buy goods from Sharjah, it allows you to uh, export, uh, uh, do your logistics, and of course deliver and give you time to be paid to uh, deliver. And therefore, uh, we have many programs, including other banks, KCB through Jiri. Again, there is the Inuka program that was spoken about this morning, where SMEs can be able to access 5,000 to 250,000 through an app. So those are areas we are looking at in partnership with ministries. Again, there is what we are calling incubation. Uh, in partnership with Ministry of Devolution, we are seeing on how we can be able to incubate startups. Now, these startups will develop them, will capacity build them uh, to a point they become SMEs so that they can be able now to get the opportunities. All right, thank you. I'd like to come to Flora kindly. All right, um, just to add to what Mr. Angatia was saying, it's, um, I like the idea of getting creative around financing, but there's one I, I, I feel that has never been addressed in Ethiopia now the banks will actually give you, lend you money based on a psychometric test. I've run business for 24 years now. Every time I go, it's always collateral financing. What can you, gi what can you give us? I've never defaulted any day in my business, yet the interest rate is not preferential. So I think as much as we are, we are doing this, creative, we also need to push back and say, listen, they also have to have some skin in the game. Because it doesn't mean um, just because you're an SME or, you, or you're a smaller business that you're not, you're not going to, to, um, to pay back. Now, in speaking about uh, manufacturing, manufacturing, you know, is the cornerstone of, of, of um, actually putting wealth in our pockets. And what I like about um, the model PS Hinga has said, and actually the big four, it gives all, every single of those pillars gives an opportunity for, for, for an SME to become a manufacturer. 
And if we have the, all the pillars looking at it creatively like he has, from, from, from one end of it, you know, from organization giving you market access, because that's actually where the, the crux of the matter is. You had um, uh, Mr. Matiangi saying, um, C.S. Matiangi saying that um, they, they are, he pushed to buy local textile. Now that, I, I do know a, a particular SME, in fact, Thika Klosmil, she's here, she says for the first time, I think in something like 20 years, government has given her an order. And this ac access to market is actually what is going to grow um, the SMEs that we are going to have in the room. Um, they definitely also do need to think differently because um, like, like Mr. Muteti says, you know, they're busting. Everybody wants to do business. But everybody wants to do business because Muteti is doing it and because somebody else. Creativity, studying your market, you really need to know who are you offering. Like now, I would, I would encourage anybody with manufacturing anything within the housing, whatever, to go there and plug in. You know, if we go to textile, if you're in anything to do from farm to fashion, go in there and actually see what can you do because scalability, is important, especially when we are looking to, to, to you know, 40% of the youth are unemployed. We need to build businesses, but we also need to make sure they scale. And scalability is what, I mean, is one thing manufacturing does offer. And if we deal with their challenges of, um, you know, finance, the other one that, that is important that I think we haven't discussed is skills. You know, um, for me in my industry, if I do want somebody very, very technical, what I have to do is poach from somebody else. You know, and um, SMEs also don't also have money to train. Uh, you're busy getting on with your business, you don't have money to train. So the more um, we upskill people, I, and, and I do know private sector is actually playing an, an interest in here. We, I know Crown Paints gets together painters, teaches them how to use their, 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 you know, to use their paints. Yes, they, are, they, they, they perhaps, I mean it is a CSR, they don't have to do this. You know, I know PG Bison is, is, is training people how to, use, how to use his materials. I know manufacturers, especially the ones, you, you know, the larger manufacturers at uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturing, are giving credit lines so that an SME can actually come pick material, manufacture it, and supply to any, of, uh, you know, to, to any opportunity that we see. And of course, um, the other thing we do need to do is to also um, continue to open up markets because, um, like we've said here, Kenya market is not going to be big enough. If you have a national distribution, the next thing you're going to do is, 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 you, is, is you are going to, going to um, want to grow your business. So manufacturing is one area that I would try to encourage um, the SMEs to look at. And one of the best things about manufacturing, and I, um, although I know you support us, is you're building, you're building a, a machinery. It, it, it has some succession. It, 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 you could be, be building a brand, let's say in agro-processing, you know very well we are 40% we are of our, of our um, GDP comes from agro-processing. Do we move up the value chain? Moving up the value chain, so I stop selling potatoes, but I brand them, my brand name. That is a brand name that can outlive you. Building brands, building legacies that will outlive you as opposed to trading. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with trading. I'm just saying you get a lot more depth and you create a lot more jobs. Even with manufacturing, there's a statistic that goes one to four or one to five. So one, one job actually supports five, five other people. Okay. I know Caxton wanted to uh, raise something. I just want to come back to you briefly um, because we are seeing many people being told become entrepreneurs, go for entrepreneurship. That is the, the, the push that's been there. But do you feel that there's enough, you know, is it being tapered enough? Because not, not everyone is cut out for entrepreneurship. So you might find a number of people who have been pushed into the entrepreneurship space yet I'm, I'm cut off to be an employee, so to speak. Do you feel there's a good balance of that kind of push because you've pointed out? I don't think it becomes an issue about, well, I think when we are choosing our career choices, you really have to be called to what you're doing. So as much as the narrative is become an entrepreneur, if you're not that way inclined, it's not going to happen. But they are sort of what I would say, a little bit of cushion. Well, I wouldn't say cushion, but there are simpler things you could do. Like you could become a subcontractor of large multinationals where they tell you, listen, um, kindly come here, hold my, you know, um, make seats. I do know GM used to do this, where they would, they, they, they would some contract a part of their production line and tell you to go and do that. What does that do for you as an entrepreneur? If you don't enjoy actually going out and looking for market every day, all you need to do is to plug into a line like that and supply GM and all other motor industries. So there, there are other ways that you can actually supply, um, um, you know, support entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship is a calling. I don't think it's something that um, you can, you know, that just happens on you. But the youth do need to think differently. And to Mr. Kiboro's point, if as a youth, 
you begin your SME when you're young, which I did 25 years ago. I now will not, re I will not re uh, retire to an SME. I'm going to retire to my corporate because I've moved up the ladder when I had the benefit of youth behind me. So it is, it, it is an area that is actually very, very fulfilling. And, um, and uh, Mr. Kiboro, we hope you will have the time to build the corporate in your time. <laughs> All right, I want to come to Kaxon just before we come to you briefly. I want to say that um, it's really interesting that this is taking place because for quite some time, government has made policy, um, consulted the industry, but the penetration of this category of the small and especially the micro enterprises has been quite difficult. But the formation of the associations like Joakali Association, associations of the leather industry, actually is enabling government to start seeing what this industry requires to prosper. And uh, it is quite interesting that uh, when you start engaging this industry, they start telling you exactly how they would want to comply with government regulations in a much more convenient way. And uh, I want to tell you that when the government started, I mean, discussing with them how they want to be taxed, they came up with very simple principles. One of them is that, yes, they want to pay taxes, but can you make it simple? Because they don't want a tax system that will force them to hire consultants to interpret for them. They want a tax system that enforces a record keeping to the detail that is required under tax. And they don't want to leave their workplaces to go and pay taxes because the nature of their business is that they have to be present at, as they, they do business at all times. And this is why you can see government has again tried to introduce the turnover tax because it is much simpler. You don't have to keep complex records. And we have even had consult, cons conversations with them on how to pay taxes and they have told us that we would, we would, they would prefer KRA to transfer the process of accounting for taxes to a mobile phone. It's quite interesting. What we are calling Joakali here, what we are calling some micro enterprises here, is what drives some economies, like the Swiss economy. Because you know these watches you wear, costing millions of shillings, are made in cottage industries, in somebody's backyard, and, and they do very well. But the reason why they thrive there is because their governments gave them an ear and they work together to promote that industry. So, so I think these engagements are good and uh, we would like to encourage more and more of these engagements because we really want policy to point towards what works for the industry. Thanks. All right, Bona Muteti, uh, even as you respond to that, maybe you could tell us how have you and you know the people who you represent managed to to survive for those who survive because you know there are some that may have you know fallen off the way in light of the tough economy one and two um, we've come from a time when you know interest rate caps were a significant challenge to SMEs especially. Uh, do you mean how the sector has managed to survive in, yes. the, in the spectre of the fight access to credit? Yes. That's a very good question, and uh, I want to inform you here that uh, we run a very demand-driven, issue-based sector. And this sector is very practical. The MSME sector, and in particular the Jokali sector, is so practical such that somebody wakes up in the morning, buys to go and buy a piece of metal, for it to turn into a sufuria by lunchtime, for it to be sold by three, so that it takes food to his family. So. Before I came here, when I was thrown uh, what I should talk about here, and it was about uh, making the product, met, making the MSEs competitive. As I told you, we run a demand-driven issue-based uh, sector. I ran it through the chairman and asked them, if I go to that forum, what is your issue in terms of make, being competitive? You know, these people, what they want to hear is solutions. Solutions to the issues. Solutions on how they can move to the next level. And this is where we have been having some disconnection on issues, on approach to SME, the dialogue. We need to be careful to separate academic approach to SME interventions to practical, practical issues. And I'll tell you, 
They told me, what is the market saying about the product from the area? The market is saying, your products are of low standards, meaning they, they, your products don't have standards. I tell you, if today you buy a hammer from Kekomba, it's so ugly, it looks like a bomb, but <laughs> it's going to outlive you. It's not branded properly and it's not designed properly. But if you buy one from the supermarket from China, it won't even last two weeks. So the market is saying your, your products are substandard. The market is also saying you have poor production methods because of lack of tools and so on. The market is also saying poor finish, which is, I agree with some of them. And the market is also saying that the products are, are substandard. So the message I brought here today to make the sector competitive, we need to address four things, practically, and that is what we want to hear. We want to hear, how do we make the SME sector address issues of quantity, quantity, production in large scale? Our people there, uh, they, they can may probably make uh, tens of reels per day or 20. They want to make 1,000 per day. How, what a mechanism, what interventions should be put in place? Who is here to tell us? Practically, what they should start doing to borrow for, they to, to, for them to start addressing that. And I, I, that's why I keep thanking P.S. Hinga. And the, I, I've seen the CEO of the MSC Authority here. Practical interventions is what is needed on the ground. So we are talking about quantity, production. What, do, what are we saying there? We are talking about productivity. How do they, what is in the productivity in the MSC sector here? What technologies are they using? What skills are they using? What tools are they using? That is what we should be talking about. It's, it's unfortunate that today, if you went to Kamukunji and the chair is here, and we have around 260 associations here in Nairobi, the technologies, the, the, the skills that are being used are the Stone Age technologies. People fold metals, putting their legs in, in buckets to, 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 calm, to cool their, their, their legs. So what we are saying here is that how do we address issues on productivity, what, what skills, what, what, what are the intervention mechanisms to skills? And this skilling, what are we going to do to skilling? You cannot tell a Jokali person to go, to go to a technical vocational institution for three years. This man is the MD for himself, he's the marketing manager, he's a father, he's a chief accountant for his, himself. You want him to close his shop and come for three years. So what intervention do you want? What can we do? to bring quality and productivity to where they are. The third one is uh, about quality. Quality of standards, raw materials. The, the raw materials that they are getting the sector. How affordable are they? How can, they? how can it be affordable to them? So lastly, branding, patent. Most of our products have no name completely, but they work. And they, I tell you, our products are affordable. They are powering the villages. You know, when you talk about SMEs, it's not about just uh, these towns. Go to the villages. You see what they are doing in the small towns. They are making things that are affordable and needed in that area. Even the areas that are, do not have this a lot of English to, to approach to issues. Lastly, lastly, I'm talking about exposure. And I want to appeal to our, to our friends here. This sector lacks exposure. And I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the president of chamber here, who gave me an opportunity to send five women to India to go and learn about loom, hand loom technology. And they are here. Where are you, ladies? The ones who went to, 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 to India. They also, this is the first time that an exposure was done at that level of the Juakali sector. I want to appeal to the people who make trade missions and technology missions. Don't go there and come and tell us to be like Singapore. And you have never taken us to Singapore. You give us a lot of lectures. At be like Singapore, you know Singapore. My people ask me, what is this Singapore? Is it a technology? Is it a country? What is there? What I am saying is this. I'm appealing to you in your trade missions. Just create a small space for three or four people. Some of the ladies that went to, 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 to China, the courtesy of our, our patron, and he's our deputy patron, the president is our patron. Some of them have never entered a plane. Actually, we had to make sure they are going as a group because it was serious exposure. What is the difference between exposing these ladies and exposing yourself who sits in an office to go and learn about technologies? The difference is that 
if you sit an of, in an office, you go and learn about technology, you'll come and put the files in your office and wait for the next, and wait for the next exposure. If you expose these people practically, they'll go, come back and say, oh my God, this is how they are doing it. I need to get this, I need to get this, I need to get this. Now, talking about now finishing, finishing. And I'm happy that uh, our people, uh, some, you know, uh, most of people are wearing our, our products. It's just that they don't accept. It's just because they're not uh, labeled. But we need now to address issues of mass production. We need to address is practical issues. And my people are here because they want to know. The way the chairman, uh, president of chamber said, there is uh, it yard, war, there is money. Tomorrow they'll be knocking his door. They want money. And I want to answer your issue of access to credit. How we survive. And most of my members here will agree. The elephant in the house is divided into three. The first one is operating and worksite areas. Number two is credit, access to credit. And number four is market. Let me talk about the access to credit. The easiest way to get money to the MSC sector is through Shylock. These others are stories, and they are very good stories. We are talking about 17 million people. We are talking about small, small disjointed issues about addressing affordable credit to them. Some are working. Some are working very well for the people with phones who know how to use technologies. The mamamboga there, down there, who has never gone to school, who does not know how to use WhatsApp, she also wants credit. So where, where, where a Shylock has beaten this initiative is that he comes and sets shop near where these people operate. And he sits there with his money, 100,000. So a guy just lifts his hand and says, 10,000 there. Because he left his TV there the other week, there is no documentation. 10,000 comes, you buy your raw material, you make, you sell, you service there, and it's very high interest rate. We need to have a deliberate, focused intervention on real access to affordable credit to these people. We can, this is a conversation that we can take on and on and on and on and on and on, but what we are saying here is that this country also lacks a, a graduation policy. Two policies that we presented to, and I can see the DG here. The country does not have a startup policy. The, star, the country does not have an approach to, 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 it's called what is it? Comfort credit or patient credit. Where he accesses money to buy tools, but to watch a tool for five years, Kwanza operate. Unampatia pesa kidogo, after two weeks you are knocking his door. Ata hajaza cooperate. So what we are saying is that um, we, we, need, we, need to, we need to summarize our issues into practical intervention ways of accessing. The, these are 17,000 people, and I hear our colleagues from KRA. I want to tell KRA one thing. If you deal with these people properly and you understand them properly, you, this country will never borrow money from outside. B but what we are saying, what we are saying is this, just to finish, and it has been an issue with the KRA. KRA does not understand the MSC sector, and I'm not blaming you. KRA has two sections. KRA has Department of Medium and Large Divisions. Practically, it doesn't have a division for small businesses. That's where the, the disconnect starts. Because when we come there, we, want, we are looking for our own. We say, we see this is Medium and Large, or Ion Yawale. We see this is Large, Ion Yawale. Then we start looking for ours. Our section in the KRA, so that we induct them, so that we have a scale-up, a patient approach to, 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 to taxes, taxation to them. We have, and I'm very happy that we're engaging. And we're engaging, and my people are here, they have said we want to pay taxes, but we want to be approached and treated a bit differently because of the dynamics in my sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think, um, <laughs> let the KRA respond, then we'll come to you, Bonangatia. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to give a feedback to the micro enterprises that we have been uh, engaging them and we have taken every feedback from them seriously, including um, how to pay taxes, when to pay taxes, because they have made proposals that they want to pay daily. They don't want, uh, some of them don't want to wait for the end of the month to pay tax. And we have factored all this into our programs. And just to give you the comfort, we have also created a specific office 
that will manage, coordinate, and implement programs relating to the Juakali sector, what we call micro-enterprises. And I, I want to say that the head of that unit is here. He is called uh, Julius Yeager. He is there. After this meeting, please get his contacts. And uh, from here, I think the discussion is going to get sweeter. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's, let's just go first, Mr. Ngachi. And he's raised a number of issues, you know, training and the fact that the reality for, for the Juakali uh, business persons, for instance, is that it becomes difficult to leave the job and go to study. So how do we strike that balance one? And we are seeing so many uh, financial institutions giving different funds or even government funds to go towards SMEs. Is it that this money is not reaching the, the people who it is uh, you know, destined for? Uh, thank you for that question. I think uh, I'll answer, uh, I want to respond to about two or three, or comment two or three issues, and of course, uh, yours in terms of capacity building. And it is inf uh, very important, uh, first and foremost, to make sure that the institutional, there is, there is family institutional support. That means most of the SMEs and uh, the Juakali or the Mamamboga, most of these businesses are owned by families. Now, what happens is one year, two, two years down the line, if that person is incapacitated for uh, any reason, you find that business collapses. And therefore, uh, for us as the chamber, we come in to incubate and capacity build you so that you are able then to understand what is governance. And therefore, that will help you in terms of running uh, your business. Uh, I want to respond, to, I mean, I want to just comment about the markets. Uh, one of the things that is very critical, again, is where do we get markets for our businesses? For example, if we talk about agribusiness, I just want to move away from that. If you, if you, if you look at agribusiness, uh, for example, we are talking of milk. Farmers have been complaining about milk. There's no market for milk, or the, the price is not conducive, it's not good at all. The other day, I happened to go to Uganda. I met the private sector, I met the head of state, and the issue of milk also came up. And we were you know, having the dialogue and saying, why don't we look at the strengths of each country? Why don't we look at the strengths of each counties? And then from there, we merge and look at opportunities that are available in other markets or in other countries. I want to look at, for example, our farmers. How do we guarantee market for our farmers? My immediate thought would be, if they could come up with, for example, cooperatives, and then our government to guarantee those farmers, to guarantee them market by making sure prisons, the health sector, the police uh, service, and uh, the schools, government schools, all buy their milk from these farmers. That is a guaranteed market. And once these people are a cooperative, they will determine what the price they are going to sell to the government. That is one area that uh, we can try and push to intervene. I also want to thank KRA because Kenya Revenue Authority has reached out to us as the Kenya National Chamber to see how we can sensitize uh, the public, you as the SMEs, on uh, tax issues. Number one, the problem of this 3%, which has been a raising concern, that is an issue that must be addressed so that, uh, like I said earlier, we need a conversation between the public sector and the private sector and also the social sector so that they can understand what is it you as KRA are doing. Now, most of these people, whenever they see a KRA person coming to their uh, workplace, I'm telling you that day they close their businesses. And this is because of fear of the unknown. They don't know whether you want to come and auction them. They don't know whether you want to come and close their businesses. And therefore, it is important moving forward to have close dialogue with them and for them to understand that paying of this tax is not a punishment. Paying of this tax comes again to support you and to support the facilities where you are in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of security, services that are uh, provided, water, sanitation, all these comes to support you. So if that information gets to them in a very good manner that they'll be able to understand, you'll never have this problem of people saying that KRA is doing this or the other. Uh, finally, is again coming back to market. I was in DRC the other day, and like I said, looking at opportunities, I was surprised that 80 million uh, Congolese actually buy their goods. They don't grow anything, they don't produce anything, they buy their goods from the neighboring countries like France. And I asked why. And the issue was the cost of goods between Kenya 
and DRC. Number one, the talk of air freight, very expensive. Our, our cargo, which is uh, Kenya Airways, it's very expensive to transport anything. Number two, the kind of uh, plane they are using has a very, very small belly. So th that, that means that any time you want to have perishables going to DRC, by the time they get there, they are rotten. Because it has taken about five, ten days at the airport looking for space. When you look at uh, transportation by road, it becomes very expensive because of the way bridge. There are multiple way bridge where you have to pay all these fees and taxes as you approach that market. So those are areas that the government may must look at in terms of legal framework and policies to make sure that these people enjoy their profits and also they are able to conduct uh, their businesses. And uh, lastly, in terms of uh, our one of our pillars, which is networking, is in terms of uh, uh, trade. Uh, trade fairs that we support you as the SMEs, we support you as the government, we uh, put you together so that you can have conversations like we are doing today. Now, this is very important because what will happen is that all the 47 counties, because this program is going to run all, all through the 47 counties and many other programs that we have to make sure we capacity build and make sure that we enhance you in terms of skill, information, and incubate you to understand exactly what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to do. And finally, yeah. is on the corruption <laughs> issue. <No>. Corruption <laughs> issue that uh, you mentioned. It is important to define to have a definition of what corruption is. You just mentioned one appears that uh, you looked at supporting SMEs in terms of those, and you came up with a, a, a price which was not competitive to China. Now, we need also to make sure that from the beginning, we make the, uh, the legislature or other uh, institutions of the government to understand so that later in the years, we don't have again the Auditor General coming to audit and saying there is, there is, there is a query here that this price is, is less and the market price was this. And then he speaks by the same media to become a scandal. So those are the okay. things. Okay, thank you. Done. Beatrice, then we can take yes, a, yes, two yes, or three yes, questions yes. from the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I wanted to plug in immediately after Richard because uh, the risk, I wanted to respond to your question. What is this that has inspired us to continue doing business and to um, seek out to thrive amid I mean, the challenges and, and the environment that we had uh, uh, painted earlier? And, and to me, I would want to say that is actually what inspired formation of uh, Leather Apex Society. Because we realized it is until we optimize the value chain that each individual player will get to, um, to excel. So we came together and we said, let us seek to collaborate along the value chain. And it's like we are looking at everybody, every player from the farm right to the marketing production, manufacturing and marketing of uh, the leather goods at the end of, of, the, of the chain. So what we are trying to do here is we are creating synergies, mutually enriching synergies between you know, micro entrepreneurs, SMEs and large scale. And one typical case model that we are coming up with is when we had uh, the presidential directive to um, source for discipline forces locally and whereby we sat down with the large scale manufacturers and came up with a model whereby when the large scale manufacturer is able to access this kind of opportunity by virtue of their standing in terms of compliance to statutory requirements, then they can outsource uh, some part components from micro entrepreneurs. And that uh, we saw as a model that can now rob in micro entrepreneurs and over time we enable them to be able to stand on their own feet. The second thing that we are doing as a society is capability building, whereby we are saying we agree where we are placed in terms of competitiveness and therefore devised programs that are already beginning to fill in the gaps. And such programs is basically where we realized that we need a very, you know, like we need a critical mass of proficient people in various areas areas of running the leather enterprises. And so far we have run a couple of programs and one successful one is where we were, I think among uh, the, the first organizations to do a national uh, training for um, teachers and designers in leather goods and therefore supplying the market with highly um, skilled individuals to, to go and play. While at capability building the things that we are doing but there are those that we are already seeking out for partnerships such as you know being able to realize innovative products Products. And for this, we realized in this country, as we speak today, we do not have product innovation centers. We have R&D institutions that are government affiliate, but we do not have easy access uh, uh, product innovation centers whereby now an SME or a micro entrepreneur can move in and prototype. And that is one thing that we're moving forward. We are looking out for partnerships so that we are able 
to establish uh, the, the, the manufacture the, the innovation centers to be able therefore to start now producing oh. innovative uh, products to address competitiveness what uh, leather apex is doing we have come up with a concept that we are calling leather wealth creation center centers or lwcc in short and here is whereby we are saying we are asking each micro entrepreneur because you see for us to be for our micro entrepreneurs to be competitive we need to ensure that we attain economies of scale. Now, if we are looking at the production capacity of each individual, uh, micro entrepreneur, small entrepreneur, they may not be able to produce to the scale that provides them an age in terms of competitiveness. So we came up with a concept whereby we're encouraging micro entrepreneurs to come together and you know, form uh, partnerships and be able to establish one a wealth creation center which is big enough to be able to al allow them to enjoy economies of skill, be, be able to, to reduce the operational costs and therefore move towards being uh, competitiveness. Right. So finally, um, the issue of marketing, we also said we don't want to sit and wait for somebody to come and you know, pick us from where we are. What we have decided to do, we decided to come up with various marketing intervention, uh, interventions and one such intervention is what we refer to as uh, Kenya International Leather and Leather Products uh, um, Trade Fair. And in this trade fair we are saying it is an opportunity for us to be able to showcase what we have to offer as an industry. Now, besides what we are doing as an Apex, what I want, I have a few things that I feel like I need to bring on to the table. Number one, Very briefly we, we have spoken a lot about policies. Our issue is not an act of policies. The biggest challenge we have is enforcement of policy. Right now as Apex we have pushed, we were among the teams that were pushing for you know uh, imposition of import duty. That we were pushing for 35, we were able to get 32% import duty on uh, any uh, imported uh, leather goods which is a good uh, um, cushion for us uh, local manufacturers because of the, pro the, the cost of production. But you see even us we are pushing for 32% what we want to, 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 to let you know is even the 25 was not adequately in, uh, enforced because you'll go to a place like Gekomba you'll find a bale of, of shoes that has not less than 50 pairs inside going for 5,000 shillings. If you work out your mathematics, that person did not even pay even uh, the, the equivalent of duty to, to, to enable them be able to sell the 50 pairs that are actually new pairs of shoes. So we are requesting that even as we enact policies, we've spoken about policies, we ought to ensure that the policies are enforced. Okay, thank you. I'd like to invite two questions from the floor briefly. Um, you could just raise your hand, the mic will come to you. We will not, unfortunately, we will not take as many as we would like to, uh, just in the interest of time, but then we would, uh, we will then have those put together and responded to appropriately from the panel. So just bring the mic. There's a gentleman in front of you there. The, the microphone. Yeah, there. Please um, introduce yourself. Tell you could kindly stand up. Uh, tell you. us your name, the organization, and which sector you're in. Yes, my name is Peter Ndongo. I'm the chairman of Kamrede Juwakari, currently in charge of the CID Center in Imoru. This is the constituency industrial development center. My question, as much as you are talking, is about electricity. This is a very interesting story, and this is my question. The CID center, the constituency industrial development center, was constructed and were fitted with the honorary one three fees meter. In the center, we have got more than 20 welding machines. We have got about two, we have got two red machines, one being a donation from the MSEA, this is Michael Small Enterprises Authority. The interesting part is this when they're talking about cooperation and what? We applied to have to be connected with the two extra three fees meters and one single fees meter at our own cost we were willing to pay. Interestingly, we did this on the 7th of June 2019. And I can tell you here, I've read this issue on different forums. The only received the, 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 the quotation of payment on January. This after paying kickbacks, I better tell you the truth. 
And then from then, this is on January, I immediately went, came to Kenya Power Headquarters and paid for the amount that they had demanded for. And after paying for the money, even today as we are talking, even as of Friday, I was told to do they wanted a wiring certificate, which I tried to look through the ministry, but we could get it. So I went back to them, what am I to do? Because I can't get the wiring certificate. And I failed to understand how was the electricity connected in the first place if there was no wiring certificate. So I was told to pay to, I don't know, I don't know exactly what and what. They are the same people who knows who I was going to send the money to someone, which, is, which has got no receipt. I better be honest in this. And he said 4,500. Now, I went there again on Friday. I was told that I go and talk to the person in charge at the depot to give me the meters. Now, I've been told now <laughs> that I pay, not to pay, to give kickback to the person who's going to produce the meters and the person who is going to fix the meters. My question is this. And we just keep on talking about, about legalization here. If a government CID center cannot be connected to electricity, which is there already, I don't understand what a globalization in this street. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take one more kindly. Just kindly introduce yourself and your industry. And then yes, let's be uh, brief kindly. Moderator and uh, distinguished uh, guest. My name is Ngure Kemodo and uh, I'm in the manufacturing sector, and uh, currently I'm manufacture uh, sanitizers or infection control materials. Okay. Uh, you know, I just want to make one quick comment and ask a question to KRI, because uh, since 1963, and most of you who can see my back, you can see I'm not a very young man. <laughs> since 1963, we have had debates like this, and I see them all the time in TVs. But I, I can tell you, I want to tell the moderator and also the panelists this, where the problem is in our country. You know, if you go to a bathroom and you turn the water on, you want to take a shower, and the water is not coming out, and you realize immediately the tube, the pipe must be blocked somewhere. And that is the story of our small scale sector in Kenya. We keep on having debate, but we are not really unbroken. If you follow that pipeline, you will find something. All the things we have talked about here, lack of standard, standardization, lack of credit, all the things that panelists have talked about here. But the biggest challenge that we have you know, in our country is we are not really addressing the root cause of this. These people you are seeing here, I can tell you they did not start with no money. Nobody starts even making a needle or making a shoe, the one we said has no standard, did not have money when he started. He was starting that money he retired from a company, got 50,000 shillings, which was a lot of money, with the hope that he makes two shoes and sells those two shoes in town, come back with more money, and grow the money. No sooner you make 50,000 shillings, you start supplying city council, you start supplying another government, you start supplying corporation. But I tell you, and you had assumed you are working capital, you discounted 45 days. Meaning, 45 days, your money would have come back. But I tell you, in this country, the issue of equation having constant, that business constant, that 45 days your money would have come back. In this country, no money come back. You supply government and hoping that they are going to pay you. 45 days, it goes to 200 days. You supply another company, it goes to 400 days. By that time, you have no money, you go to Shirok. And the solution, the reason is why Shiroks are becoming, are thriving so much, is because nobody is paying anybody. So the question is, if the government is not enforcing law so that we are paid that even you are carrying 20 shillings come back, this sector is going to limp and limp and we keep on saying we are together with Singapore. Singapore makes sure that if, you, if I give you an LPO, 35 days or 30 days, 30 days is 30 days. Now the government is the one not okay. even paying us. So we are owed so much. Nakumat corrupts, other business corrupts. Ushumi is 45% government owned. But all these people, I can tell you, they have so much money owed by the government, even Juwakari people, by, the, by, the, by Ushumi. Okay. And this 45% of it is government. Now the question is, if the government can take away the money from the, these people, and they don't pay, because if Ushumi is government, really, and they corrupts, 
how do you ha what is going to happen in our country? The other question, the, the question I had is for the KRA. Very briefly, KRA. KRA yes, the last one. KRA says, and this is a disease that we are seeing in our sector, KRA says that you cannot invoice anyone without having VAT attached to it. So now, I invoice a company, 200,000, and I attach a ETR because that's a rule by KRA. But that guy takes me, takes 200 days to pay me. But yet he goes to KRA, pays the withholding tax, and uses the same, same receipt I gave him to claim his VAT as input. Stealing money from the government and corrupting me, and me the money I have paid the government, the gov when I, government KRA comes to ask me to pay the money, I don't have the money because the other guy didn't pay me. And this is what the disease we are seeing in this country. These okay. people have the money to start the business, if only the government and the industry can standardize and remove these things, go follow the pipe and then broke that pipe. Okay. And then we will see that we are going to survive. Thank you very much. Own. I'd like to just ask Caxton to briefly respond to that. Um, this one was directly at KRA. If you could briefly, because we need to move to the next panel. I don't think it is really a KRA problem. I think uh, what he's trying to say is that uh, there are delayed settlement, there is delayed settlement of bills, both from government and from uh, their trading partners in the private sector. Um, they also say that the same people report that they have transacted with them. So what I would like to say here is that, uh, yes, we know that sometimes some of our taxpayers run into challenges like these ones of cash flow because they haven't been paid by the persons they supplied to their clients. And when you have this kind of problem, and again, like somebody said, don't run away from KRA. And that's why uh, those who run into these problems come to us and say they have gone into this particular challenge and they would like to have a rescheduling of their tax liabilities so that they can pay in installments in a manner that is much more convenient to them. So the solution exists. Okay. So if you have such a problem, just to visit your tax manager, explain the problem, provide the evidence, and I can assure you an arrangement that is much more favorable to you will be arrived at. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And just in closing, I'd like PS to just quickly address the issue of the power. All right, so first of all, let me begin by apologizing to you because what you've gone through, you shouldn't go through. And secondly, let me say that these are not public servants, these are criminal enterprises. And that is why everybody that is here today, we must, this war on corruption must be won. Because you're a small business, you're saying you've got the money to pay, but let me, let me just guarantee you that I'm going to pick up this issue with the peers, energy, I'll get your contact details and you will have the meters installed. Thank you very much, and I'd like to just thank our panel. Let's give them a round of applause as we appreciate them. Um, in the interest of time, we'll have to one word. We, we, don't, we unfortunately don't have the time for that because, because we have to get into another panel before we get just into one. the next program. Yes, Just Laura. one issue. Um, and to the gentlemen, and actually to all SMEs, I'd like to encourage people to join up. In unity, there's numbers. When I, how I actually joined Kenya Association, Association of Manufacturers is one um, day, I think, they used to come on uh, Kajo, you know Kajo, they used to come on a Friday. So they would come and, and they said, where's the owner? Kubwa Kwapi, and I was not there. And they wanted to take my people. Why? Because we didn't have our fire license on the wall. Now what I, what I did, funnily enough, I was, had been now introduced to come and I was supposed to meet them. So I told them, oh, I've got to run to go and sort out this problem. And they said, no, hold on. You don't need to go anywhere. Here is the head of Kajo. Call them and tell you what the problem was. The problem was actually we had done the fire training, but they didn't have paper to print the license, yet they want to arrest you. So my message is this. We join associations. We are able to escalate. Today, because you're here, you've been able to get the PS's attention. You will be sorted. But every single day, this is going to continue to happen. So the power of associations, the power of groupings, and, and, and the, when you're able to escalate, then you don't have to bribe. We actually particularly do not have to because I always, I do that Kenyan thing, do you know who I know? And once you, okay. you sort of mulika these people, it will reduce. 
So associations are completely important, be it chamber, be it calm, be it okay. whatever association there is, it's important. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, 30 I, seconds. Yes, I want to address one, one of our missing. When we talk about SMEs and the importance of creating jobs, something that we have realized in our research is that there is a segment of the society that is not being addressed. The uneducated, semi-educated, and the school dropouts segment. These are most of the people that hang in our villages, in the rural areas. They are never factored in into this, into this value chain of uh, conversations. That is one. Number two, I want to assure no. you that um, the, the MSC sector and the Jokali sector itself is the sector today that can create a job today based, for those people based on their interest. Okay. So we, we encourage you that you, if you have any youth around your village and he has wanted to do something and is not educated, just call me up. I'll fix him the same day. All and right. Thank you very working. much, Bona thank you. Muteti. Thank you. And I'll Close. We'll have to close this session for now. Thank you very much for our panel. Once again, let's appreciate them with a round of applause.